really, really excited to introduce to you. So Tom Ridge is currently a team lead and tech lead at Culture Amp. Um, but before that, he worked at Two Red Kites, where I work. And so when I started working there as a brand new little intern with no development experience, he was my number one mentor, ally, and cheerleader, and was just a really fantastic person to be around, and is now one of my best friends. Um, apart from just being a fantastic human in general, who's so supportive of people in the community, of junior developers, and just everyone he meets, uh, he is co-organiser of Briz Ruby. He has been a member of Ruby Australia, um, was once vice president, knocked you out of that. Uh, <laughs> he's got a fantastic wife, uh, Josie, and two adorable twin daughters, Ali and Chloe. He's really into tabletop games, uh, including D&D, which may be mentioned in this talk. Just a little. Uh, I heard the best description of him the other night at the opening party. He is ruthlessly positive, and it is my great honour to introduce Tom Ridge. It's, it's very, very hard to follow an introduction like that. Um, but just uh, as a quick, quick aside, can we get a big round of applause for all the organizers and everyone involved in setting it up? It's been awesome. Um, so my name's Tom Ridge. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about building APIs you want to hug with GraphQL. Um, and in 2018, I was introduced to a completely new way of seeing the world. Uh, it changed my perspective, opened my eyes to amazing possibility, and introduced magic into my life. It was absolutely 100% Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> In news that I am sure will come as a surprise to my colleagues and attendants, I've decided to quit my job and join my friend's Dungeons and Dragons startup. The geek's dream. And I get to build a character sheet feature. And as only a conference speaker's luck would have it, the first designs have come in today. <laughs> so it's a bit threadbare, but, but there's, there's enough here to work with. All I need to do is get my character's name and, and race from their API. A, a race in this case is something like an elf or a dwarf or a human, you know, stuff that you'd see every day out in the street. So we start talking to their, their RESTful API, and all of a sudden I need to sit through all this data just to get my character's name. We remember, despite being very sleep deprived with twins, I can guarantee you, we need to get the race too. So we grab the race ID and make a second request. Oh, more data to sift through, and, and two requests. We quietly, or considering we're mic'd up not so quietly, think to ourselves that this is only going to get more complicated as we build our app out. So we speak to our friend, and they're kind enough to create another endpoint for us. A custom one this time, and well, this is more of the data we want. But we need to start worrying about authorization on each new endpoint. And we know that we've got a bunch more features down the line that aren't just character sheets. Are we going to need to build an endpoint for every single one? And of course, there's the clients to consider too. We want our app available on phones, desktops. And of course, who doesn't want to look at their character sheet when they're on the way to get snacks from their internet-powered fridges? Now, all of these have got different data needs that won't be serviced by a custom endpoint. If only there was an alternative solution that could be served up in a handily digestible under 20 minute format. <laughs> so we're here today to talk GraphQL, and I am more excited than ever to talk to you about how to build amazing APIs with it. But first, let's talk some fundamentals. GraphQL is a query language specification for APIs and it empowers clients to issue declarative queries against a singular endpoint. Through these queries, we can, traverse, we can traverse the graph representation of our application domain, pulling out discrete trees of data from a schema, no more or less than exactly the information we requested. With a strong type system and introspection, we can be certain about the shape of data being returned. In a nutshell, in GraphQL, you can have an API where you ask for just what you need, and get exactly that in the shape that you expect. And this briefest of introductions is really all you need to know to get an understanding of what GraphQL can do. The trouble is that it's very easy to get an API that isn't as huggable as it is hideous. So how do we go about building something that's a joy to work with? 
that's easy to understand and actually equips your engineers across all disciplines for success in the long term? How do we go about building huggable APIs? So as it turns out, this is a bit of an inside speaker tip, I discovered that APIs aren't actually a tangible thing. So hugging is right out of the question, but today we're gonna to tackle a facet to GraphQL that will have you building evolvable GraphQL APIs in no time that are at least pretty lovable. And that's through good schema design. Unsurprisingly, this is harder than it sounds, but a good schema is the one that expresses clearly the language of your domain and accurately models it through a graph. Today we're gonna to explore some simple techniques and rules of thumb that you can apply in your approaches to building your own schemas and avoid the same pitfalls and mistakes that I've made along the way. To do this, we're gonna explore a domain together that's well known for its simplicity. Currently on the fifth edition, Dungeons and Dragons has been published since 1974, and within these tidy 316 pages, <laughs> contains all the answers to how to name things in this domain that we could possibly want. Which means that we have the luxury of being able to just focus on the modeling. So in order to model our domain, we should probably have some data to reference. This is my first ever player character, McGee, a wood elf, and a testament to the fact that naming things is hard even outside of programming. <laughs> He'll help us form a data picture to go along with our designs. First though, we'll need to get our app ready to go, so we'll install the GraphQL uh, Ruby gem in your Ruby fr web framework of choice and build a schema which will probably look something like this. And you'll immediately notice that we have three root types, query, mutation, and subscription. For today, it's enough to know that mutations are all about rights, subscriptions let us listen for updates that we're interested in, but really what we wanna focus in on today is querying, because reading data forms such a large part of what we do. Remembering our designs from earlier, because we've, we've got a job to do, we start thinking about how we can add our first real field to the query type. Attaching our character data to the designs, we start thinking about what the data represents, starting with our character's name. In a game of Dungeons and Dragons, a name is a property of a player character. A quick check through the rule book, I'm really not gonna actually look, that'll take me a while. And we're all set to create our first node on our domain graph. When we introduce a player character node, because according to the literal rules of the domain, that's what McGee is, a player character. If we go back to our query type, we'll add our first field, we'll call it player character, a name that represents the language of the domain. When we make a query against our API asking for a player character, it'll resolve to this field. But this field's gonna be an object type, which means that it'll support additional fields defined on it so that we can return our character's name, race, and just about anything else. And so we do. We've begun modeling our player character type with a bunch of different fields and additional types, but we've fallen into a bit of a trap. Our design only called for two properties to be re represented, and we've gone ahead and modeled the world. All we needed to do is represent our player character's name and race. Anything more than that at this point is overkill. This example is extremely conference level contrived, sure. But in the real world, it's far easier to add fields than it is to take them away. Ensuring that you're only exposing the data your clients have an immediate need for not only prevents you from concerns around field deprecation, but helps you be more deliberate about the structure of your API. So with the snap of our fingers, we've reduced it back down to the fields that we had an immediate need for, along with a handy description of the type to help clients introspecting our API have a really good idea about what they're getting back and an ID field which helps to signify that it's something unique. At this point, all three of our fields are scalar types, of which Boolean, floats, date time, and integers also form a part. And because these types often represent the leaves of the query, the actual data being returned, it's a really good idea to set null to false, and this will help you avoid situations where your Boolean types might return nil instead of just true or false. But something's still not quite right here. I've been thinking RESTfully again. If we remember our original complaint with a RESTful API, it's that we needed to make an additional request to get our race name. With GraphQL, we can and should get this from the one query. 
How well, where to put this information in our graph is the question. What we're really saying in a graph context is that we want to return something like race ID. We want a new node on our graph instead. Your GraphQL APIs are not and should not necessarily be a one-to-one -to, -one to your database design. Our queries return discrete trees of data from that graph, so it's trivial to request details from the player character's race, provided that the linkage is there. So seeing as our objective was to get the name of our character's race, let's create that linkage and get to work. We've created our race object type, complete with ID and name, then we've added it as a field back alongside our player character to fill the graph. In order to test how we resolve on this type, we can go ahead and implement some methods. These methods are called when we resolve our queries and conform to the types defined on those fields. And as simple as this is, it's an extremely effective way of prototyping your APIs. It enables engineers across both front and back end disciplines the opportunity to validate your assumptions about a domain before wiring it up for persistence. This schema-driven design approach is a great way to start building out your APIs with GraphQL, and it enables us to start issuing queries that are immediately expressive and give ourselves a really good sense of the shape of our domain. So let's recap what we've learned so far. Adding fields is cheap, but only add what you need when you need it. This is gonna help you be more considerate and deliberate about providing more detail to the graph, as well as avoiding extra unnecessary complexity when dealing with performance considerations or dependencies from clients. This approach enables us to be more flexible with our schema, helping to ensure that it remains evolvable as we consider each field in turn. At the same time, recognize when a new op field is an object type waiting to be uncovered. This might be as simple as only exposing an ID on a new node, or you might see a clump of similarly named fields like date something or address home, which is usually a really good smell that you've got something there that needs encapsulation within its own object type. And finally, you don't need to have persistence there to get started wiring stuff up. It enables you to validate your domain design and equip your front and back end engineers to work towards the contract rather than one side or the other dictating it. As some of these made the mistake of just getting things wired up, stopping instead to start thinking about the domain first will ensure a greater likelihood of the API being something that's evolvable over time. And as conference like would continue to have it, it looks like we've got a new design. It looks as though we're ready to start iterating and add classes and levels to our character sheet features. Now, classes in Dungeons and Dragons are a tool to enable players to indulge in some good old-fashioned power fantasy. In McGee's case, being that he's a druid, it's the opportunity to transform into a chicken at a moment's notice. <laughs> Whilst playing, a player will level up in their chosen class, and with this knowledge fresh in mind, let's think about how this domain knowledge can be applied to our graph. Because player characters choose their class, we know to add a player class type as a node on that graph, connecting it with our player character. Now let's take the step to add the field to our player character type. And because we want our field names to be as close to the domain language as possible, we've created a field named class and defined it as being our new player class type, which we're gonna go ahead and implement now. And we've created a type with just the fields we needed, and we're feeling pretty good about our progress. However, classes in D&D are typically a pretty fixed list, and our class name field is just a string, but there's, as luck would have it, a handy solution for that. GraphQL affords us enum types, which enables us to restrict the list of allowable values for our class names through queries and mutations, as well as aiding our client's ability to discern information about the field at hand. In this case, we means we can be certain about the range of class names that are going to be returned by our query. If you have a fixed list of allowable values for a field, consider using enum types to provide certainty around those inputs. The great thing about this is that whilst it's a representation of a fixed list, it affords us the ability to add any additional values on top of that. Helping our APIs continue to be evolvable as time goes on. Looks like our API isn't the only thing that's evolvable as there's a new design waiting for us. And we've been tasked with supporting ability scores. And we think back to our character McGee and his amazing wisdom and ability to see things miles away, but really useless charisma, he's not a friendly guy, to inform our approach as to how we might go modeling these scores. 
This ability score will give us a modifier to our dice rolls when determining if we're successful at from spotting some hidden detail in a room or successfully haggling for a cheap horse. This game's fun, trust me. <laughs> the bottom value of an ability score is always between 1 and 20, and depending on where we sit within that range, we'll get a modifier between negative 5 all the way up to plus 5. So if we've got a score of 16, we get a plus 3. A score of 12 gets a plus 1, and a score of 8 gets a minus 1. This, if we stop to look and examine just the bottom score, we start to realize that there's a bit more than just a value here. This number represents the base score of the ability of the same name and includes bonuses from the character's race, bonuses from the character's class, and these are accumulated to help us form our total ability score. But how are we going to model this on our graph? Well, our colleagues have jumped on the graph girl bandwagon, and it's, a, it's about time. I've been sitting here talking for about 15 minutes. <laughs> and added a new type on our domain graph, which is responsible for those bonuses that we saw earlier. So with a bit of thinking, we can come up with the following query. And whilst we're getting everything we need to calculate the ability score here, we're forcing business logic onto the client by making it responsible for knowing how to reach that total score and to do the actual calculation itself. Our query essentially encapsulates an implicit domain concept that we needed to uncover, an ability score. So when describing your, your GraphQL schemas, it's important that you think in terms of use cases. Once we can derive the data used to generate an ability score from other sources and types, fundamentally, it's a core domain concept and deserves its own type and known in our graph. And when we're modeling our domain, there's a temptation to only represent the data or couple ourselves too closely to our views. But what we're really trying to represent is the business use case. So we'll go ahead and add our ability score node in before implementing it. As a type of its own, as well as adding additional support for arguments so that we can query more effectively. If we review the graph once more, we think that ability score's got the right idea linking back to player characters, and we apply that same thinking to our race and player class so that we can now start using them as fields on our query type as well. This gives us multiple jumping off points to start exploring our application domain. We start to get this picture about how we can build up this enormous possibility space over time. Our teams are no longer building APIs for features, but discovering new ways to utilize this data as they build their features out. We are now equipped to build expressive queries that pull out discrete trees of data. Queries that are declarative and easy to interpret, like this one, which will pull out the player characters that have chosen to play as half ox, and enable us to extract exactly the information we need in the shape we expect. Since the start, we've been revisiting this graph, identifying it as it expands with new types and fields and watching this space evolve. We've been thinking in graphs. Today, we tackled schema-first design and talked about how our approaches need to differ from the approach that we typically take with a RESTful API. We've built out a small domain graph using a domain language that was pretty well established. We thought about the composition of the nodes on the graph the relationship between those nodes and what that means for our types and queries. But what if we were exploring a domain that wasn't so easily referenced within the hand reach of me right about now? How can we model our own domains? Once we can start at the schema, taking a step back and considering your domain from a purely graph perspective first, without needing to consider too heavily the fields that you might have on those nodes, can help equip you for success on the path towards building out your APIs. We've recently undertaken these steps within my team after implementing a schema that didn't really match the domain. We've explored and modeled with domain experts that weren't necessarily engineers to draw a graph that represented the data. And so I've come out of these sessions with a couple of handy hits which will help you run your own. So first, keep the scope small. If you've got an existing domain to model or a small feature to roll out, GraphQL can be adopted incrementally. And whilst you shouldn't couple your API to a feature, focusing in on modeling a subset of that domain will keep you from feeling overwhelmed and ensure discussions that are limited to just the data and user cases at hand. With GraphQL, you're building an API that represents your domain, 
You're not building APIs for features. Keep revisiting what you've mapped out in your graph before implementation to see if it accurately represents a domain concept that isn't encapsulated by other nodes within that graph. And ask yourselves each time that you see a screen or a design, what is this data a property of? And where does this sit? Surprise, surprise, as engineers, we aren't always the domain experts we think we are. <laughs> Modeling from the graph gives us the opportunity to invite some actual domain experts along to help you start thinking about the data being displayed and what it represents. This act of building a graph together as your first step is a very deliberate approach to ensuring your schemas are off to the right start and can help to really foster relationships and collaboration across organizational boundaries within the company. This collaboration and communication shouldn't really be new, but we as engineers will often move fast and break things before realizing that maybe the modeling was off. So to close out today, think in terms of your use cases. Rather than just modeling the data or the view, consider if you've got a domain concept that needs to emerge and try to ensure that your business logic is handled by the server rather than the client. Consider the structure of your application as a graph. This will mean that it's not necessarily a one-to-one -to, -one to your database modeling and that you'll want to be con conscious of the relationships between nodes and how they interconnect. Using graph modeling exercises within your team and members of your business is a great way to engage with and lock down that domain. It's called GraphQL for a reason. So it shouldn't be any surprise at this point that your ability to think in and, and leverage modeling your domain on a graph is kind of critical to building out well-designed schemas. Fundamentally, though, success with the GraphQL schema comes from both having experts in GraphQL and experts within your domain. And they're frequently not the same person. Proactively seeking out the sources of domain expertise for whatever it is that you needed to model in your domain and exploring where it fits on your graph will really help you put in good stead for a schema that empowers your engineers now into the future. Thank you very much. If you're looking for any resources or tips or handy guides to schema design, uh, there's a gist up there, and I will be putting the slides up after the talk. Um, as an aside, I really went out of my way to commit to the player's handbook bit because I left it at my accommodation. So I have a spare copy going around. <laughs> and there's a really nice crux section of geekery that I explicitly, as a Dungeons & Dragons player, went to go get this book to facilitate a really small joke in the talk. But the first person to tweet at me, uh, TJ Ridge on Twitter, with the name of my character that's uh, here at the conference can get this uh, book, especially if you're very interested in selling playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>